Hello and welcome everyone. Today we will be presenting how to evaluate low anion gap. The anion gap is because we have equal number of ions inside our body. The serum contains an equal number of positively charged ions and negatively charged ions. However, an anion gap is calculated by subtracting the sum of the serum chloride and bicarbonate from the serum sodium. This is basically means the calculated cations minus the calculated anions. So based on that, we face a gap in the anions, which is called as the anion gap. Now serum potassium contributes minimally, so it is mostly excluded in the calculation of the anion gap. Now the value of sodium is almost always higher than the combined value of chloride and bicarbonate, resulting in a typical what is called as a positive anion gap. So this is a gamble gram which shows the red here being the sodium which is always very large amount in the blood followed by chloride and bicarbonate. So this minus this is giving us the anion gram. So apart from sodium, the other anion cations are potassium, calcium and magnesium. These are not usually measured. Apart from chloride and bicarbonate, the other that are not usually measured are the sulfate, phosphates, organic acids and proteins. So basically there are three formulas for an anion gap calculation that is sodium minus bicarb plus chloride which is the most commonly used. Theoretically you can say it is the measured cations minus the measured anions or you can say the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. So uh, pre-1980 the reference range, the initial reference range for an anion gap was 8 to 18 which was considered to be normal. Now in the 8 a revision was done with the introduction of a new serum electrolyte assay. The reference range revised was between 3 to 9. And a definition of a low anion gap is defined as an anion gap that is less than 3. So currently it is 3 to 9, which is called the normal anion gap, and below 3 it is low anion gap, and below above 9 it is high anion gap. So, what are the causes of the low anion gap? So we'll go case wise. The first case is a healthy 30 year old patient with a chemistry panel measured during a routine checkup, which showed an anion gap of two. So why should a healthy 30 year old have an anion gap of two? The most common is a testing error. Now, what are the common causes? The measurement error in serum chemistry is the most prevalent reason for a low anion gap. The anion gap is calculated based on three variables, sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Error in measuring any of these can result in a error. So what are the types of error? A pre-analytical error, this occurs during sample collection, transportation, storage, which impact the accuracy of the results. The other is analytical errors, this arise in the measurement issues, where poor quality control in the lab results in an incorrect assessment of the blood levels of these ions. So the recommended action is if previous states do not show a low anion gap, it suggests that the current low reading may be an anomaly due to the errors in the testing process. And a repeat testing is to be done to eliminate the possibility of testing error. The patient should undergo a repeat serum electrolyte sampling. This step is crucial to verify the initial finding and ensure an accurate diagnosis and management. This is especially important if the patient is clinically stable. If the patient is clinically unstable, we must look for causes. So the first cause of low anion gap is testing error. So the next case, a 50 year old with a recent diagnosis of gastric cancer is admitted for nutritional support. The patient reports minimal oral intake for the last two months and appears cachexic. Now the laboratory values on admission and on serial measurement of the albumin is 2 and the anion gap is 2. So what are the key concepts to understand here? There is a very critical role of albumin over here. Albumin is a negatively charged plasma protein, constitute most of the unmeasured anions in the anion gap. It is most abundant protein in the plasma, contributing significantly to the normal anion gap. So, uh, the decrease in the albumin causes our malnutrition, impaired hepatic synthesis, acute and chronic inflammation, and losses through urinary and GI tract. A decrease in the serum albumin concentration leads to what is called as a low anion gap. 
So when albumin levels fall, chloride ions rise to compensate for the loss albumin ions, maintaining the serum electroneutrality. Now you must correct for the hypoalbuminemia. That is, uh, anion gap is adjusted for hypoalbuminemia by adding 2.5 milliequivalents per liter for every 1 gram per deciliter decrease in the albumin from the normal baseline of 4. Now, corrected anion gap is measured anion gap plus 2.5 into 4 minus the measured albumin. Application to this particular patient for the patient with an albumin of 2, the corrected anion gap is 7 because we are adding 5 for the 2 decrease, indicating the return to a normal value when adjusting for the hypoalbuminemia. So, first and the foremost, when you get a normal anion gap or low anion gap, please correct for albumin. Now, decrease in the unmeasured anion or the albumin is one of the causes of low anion gap. So next case, a 50 year old gastric ulcer patient with acute abdominal pain, the lab test shows an albumin level of 2 and an anion gap of 13. So here we must correct for the hypoalbuminemia and thereby correcting we get a high anion gap over here which is 18. So the clinical implication is the corrected anion gap of 18 suggests the possibility of a metabolic acidosis. So, always correct for the hypoalbuminemia because it may mask a very serious disorder which may be going on inside the patient. So, this elevated level warrants targeting tests such as lactate measurement, abdominal imaging, surgical consultation to identify and treat the underlying cause of this disorder. So, failing to adjust the anion gap for hypoalbuminemia could lead the clinician to overlook the metabolic acidosis because the patient has a severe intraabdominal issue already. He could have a hollow viscous perforation which can be a medical emergency. So, next case, a 50-year-old bipolar affective disorder patient with obtundation after an overdose of home medications. He is admitted with a anion gap of 0. So, what could be the possible reasons over here? So, the key points are the effect on cations on the anion gap is very, very important. An increase in cations can also lower the anion gap. So, potassium, magnesium or calcium levels rising high can lower my anion gap. These changes are usually detected through direct measurement of these cations. Now, certain cations not routinely measured like lithium can lead to low or negative anion gap. The overdose of lithium in this case results in an excess of positive lithium ion. The excess lithium ion was balanced by increase in the negatively charged chloride while the sodium levels remain unchanged. This increase in the chloride leads to a decrease in the calculated anion gap. So, the clinical implications, a low or negative anion gap in a right clinical context such as in this patient who could be on medication like lithium for his psychiatric disorders can be a cause of low anion gap. Early recognition of the supratherapeutic lithium level is crucial and hemodialysis is an effective treatment for removing the lithium and preventing further complications. So, the next cause, an increase in an unmeasured cation can result in low anion gap. Next case, 70 year old with osteoarthritis presents with nausea and tinnitus. The patient takes no medication other than the over the counter aspirin for his arthritis. Lab test on admissions shows a chloride level of 115 and an anion gap of 0. So, what could happen over here? A overestimation of the chloride can result in an ion selective electrode misinterpretation of the halide ions like bromide and iodide can be misinterpreted as a chloride. This is relevant for patients using certain sedatives and sets with increased salicylate levels. The clinical implication is that an inaccurate high chloride reading leads to false low anion gap necessitating investigation for bromide, iodide and salicylate ingestion in patients with low anion gap provided there is a clinical context. The artificial low anion gap may conceal conditions like salicylate poisoning which typically presents with an elevated anion gap acidosis. So, the next cause, uh, overestimation of the chloride because it is a measured 
anion. The next case, a 70-year-old patient with fatigue while riding bicycle, serial lab testing shows anemia, renal insufficiency and an anion gap of 2. What could be the possible reasons? Uh, elevated level of positively charged proteins like monoclonal immunoglobulins can reduce the anion gap with a compensatory increase in negatively charged ions, mainly chloride, leading to a decrease in the calculated anion gap. Conditions such as multiple myeloma, which produce positively charged immunoglobulins, can be indicated as low anion gap. This suggests that a low anion gap should trigger investigation for monoclonal gammopathy in the clinical context. Polyclonal increase in immunoglobulin levels can similarly affect the anion gap if these immunoglobulins are positively charged. So, increase in positively charged proteins can be the other cause. So, you must also remember the other cases where immunoglobin levels can be as elevated like chronic kidney disease, cirrhosis and HIV. So, the next case, a 70-year-old patient with replacement of dislodged gastrostomy feeding tube which led to no enteral intake for the last three days. The lab test on admission shows a sodium of 170 and an anion gap of 0. Now, hypernatremia can cause due to impaired access or to free water or urinary loss of free water. In severe cases, the patient's serum sodium concentration can exceed the upper limit of the lab assessment that is 170 leading to an underestimation of the true sodium levels. Besides exceeding the assay limits, underestimation can occur in hyperviscosity states like hyperproteinemia and hyperlipidemia, complicating the aspiration of an adequate serum aliquot. Direct potentiometry can resolve this issue, however. The impact of anion gap is the underestimation of the serum sodium when combined with the accurately recorded chloride and bicarbonate leads to a decreased anion gap. So the clinical implication is in patients with hypernatremia or decreased low anion gap, it is important to consider the possibility of a serum und sodium underestimation. This consideration is crucial for accurate assessment and management. Understanding the underlying cause of hypernatremia and ensuring accurate lab tests is essential in patient care. So the final cause is sodium underestimation. So to summarize everything, once you get a low anion gap, the first could be a testing error. If the patient is normal, then it should be considered as testing error, then repeat the test again. If the low albumin level persists, then correct for albumin. Assess for the cause of the elevated anion gap. If after correcting for albumin, you get a high anion gap. If after correction of albumin you still get, then check cations which are not measured. And in the clinical context, you look for other cations like lithium also. Next case, if the cations are also normal, look for elevated immunoglobulin levels in the clinical context. If the immunoglobulins are normal, then look for whether the chloride is the possible, if there is a possibility of chloride overestimation or sodium underestimation. In that case, please notify the lab that you are looking for these particular disorders. And if none of this is found, then you can take a nephrology opinion as to what could be the other possible causes. Thank you for your patience.